and Dr. Owens, it's all yours. All right. Well, thank you for the uh, introduction there. Um, so hello, everyone. Thank you for joining us in um, you know, live time today. My name is Dr. Anna Owens, and I'm an assistant professor for the College of Psychology at Nova Southeastern University. Um, my passion kind of lies in creating school-based um, mental health services, social emotional learning, um, interventions, and then implementing evidence-based practices, college and career readiness. I have worked as a school counselor in Palm Beach County, um, and I also um, work in private practice in, in Boca. So in my experience, I work mainly with children and adolescents as well as their families. So today we're gonna talk about school being out and why social and emotional connectedness is gonna be more um, important, more essential than ever. Um, and this is really a topic that is near and dear to my heart. Um, so we're gonna get into that a little bit more. Just really briefly, um, an agenda of what we will be discussing today. Um, we're first gonna start off with an icebreaker and why it's important to break the ice. We're gonna get an understanding of how, why social emotional learning matters to everyone and not just school aged children. We're going to provide um, Castle's definition for the five core competencies and then how to apply them to our everyday life. We're gonna talk about supporting students and really understanding some of the complex range of emotions that um, they've experienced or may be experiencing currently. In addition, we're gonna provide some guidelines for parents, caregivers, families, uh, on how to kind of build resilience in, in this time. Um, and then lastly, we're going to talk about taking action and what it looks like to create a family action plan that's going to work for your family. First, let's start with our icebreaker. I like this icebreaker because um, <clears throat> it's something simple and obviously this is a live webinar, but we're not interactive. At, um, you can leave comments, but we're, uh, we're not, you know, speaking to each other live. Um, and this is something that you could do in a small group, large group, or even um, virtually. So I like this icebreaker and kind of the meaning. So what you'll need is you'll need a rock. Um, look around, rocks are everywhere. You can find them um, in your garden, you can find them on the streets, um, you pretty much can find a rock anywhere. Um, and then also some Play-Doh. And if you don't have Play-Doh, that's okay. You could also use maybe like a stress ball, something like this. Um, and if you're a real adventurous parent, maybe even some slime or something like that. So, <clears throat> so let's break the ice. We're gonna talk about Play-Doh problems, rock problems. So first, hold the rock in your hand and then squeeze it as hard as you can. Try to bend it, try to roll it. Are you able to change this rock? Okay, now you're going to want to place the Play-Doh in your hand. And same thing, right? You want to squeeze it as hard as you can. You can bend it a little bit. You can roll it between your fingers. And think, are you able to change this Play-Doh? So right now, you may be feeling worried, anxious, or even scared. And in moments like this, um, I want you to kind of think of the rock in the Play-Doh. So a rock um, is hard and it can't be changed, right? You cannot control the shape that it takes. The Play-Doh, however, can be changed. You can control the shape that it takes. Um, and so now I want you to think about what you can control in your life. And believe it or not, friends, there are some things that we do have control of in our lives that are happening in the world right now. Um, so let's kind of talk about um, what are the rocks and what are the Play-Dohs in our life. So the rocks are going to be the things that I cannot control, right? So the rocks are, I cannot control what other people do or what they say. I can't control the fact that schools have been um, canceled, events, graduations, proms, um, awards, ceremonies, I can't control those things. I also cannot control the news um, and maybe 
uh, what political parties are saying. I don't have control over that. Also, sickness is not something that we are able to control. Um, we're not able to control the work that is assigned to us or um, how doctors are making their recommendations or other metal, medical professionals. We also cannot control the fact that restaurants and stores have closed. Um, large places like Disney World, um, that may make us feel upset if we had to cancel a, a family uh, outing or trip, but we can't control that. We also cannot control how long this will last. But the Play-Doh, um, those are the things that we can control, right? So we can control what I say and what I do. I can also control the way that I treat others and, and show respect to others. I get to control my um, positive attitude, um, also my mindset, right? We get to control our hygiene, washing our hands, singing a song or making up a new song of, of how long we feel comfortable washing our hands. We also get to control how well that we're doing the work that is assigned to us. I get to control what I watch online or on TV. Um, also social media is a big one. A lot of times I tell um, our young people, students, that um, to go through their social media and to unfollow um, people or, or things that they don't find positive or that maybe doesn't bring them joy because we tend to follow things and it may make us feel bad about ourselves. So that's something that you can control. Um, and then also getting outside, getting some fresh air, finding some fun things to do around the house or with family. Um, those are things that, that we can control. Okay, so what do icebreakers really do? Um, icebreakers foster social emotional learning at the core, right? This creates a supportive, a caring, and encouraging environment. Um, icebreakers kind of get the, the room, or in this case, the virtual room, um, energized by helping members get to know one another. So again, if we were doing a live interactive, um, we, I would, instead of telling what the, um, the things that we can and cannot control, I would ask for group members to maybe share the things that they um, are not able to control and then the things that they are able to control. Um, it helps break, break up the, the stiffness of a presentation or webinar, and then also allows for team building, bonding, um, feeling inclusive, and an overall interaction and connection with others, okay? And so that's going to be the big one of why um, icebreakers are important, especially when we're talking about social-emotional learning. Okay, why is social-emotional learning so important? So hands down right now, we know that social emotional learning is the most important thing that we can be focusing on. It's a daunting reality, but the worst thing that educators and parents can be doing is to not make this a priority. Um, so social emotional learning is it's, it's everywhere in education, right? It's, it's been quite a, a hot topic for quite some time. I like to think of it as the fine arts of being a successful human being. Um, and I also, I don't believe that any student can access their full level of um, academic potential without first unlocking their social emotional self. So here's the definition of, um, you know, why social emotional learning matters to everyone. And the definition describes it as the process in which children and adults. And so that's interesting to me because we're not just talking about school aged youth here. We're also talking about adults as well. Um, and so this is the process in which we acquire and apply these knowledge, attitudes, and skills. We're able to manage emotions, um, set and achieve goals, showing empathy for others, um, maintaining positive uh, relationships in our lives, and ultimately making some good choices. Okay, so I really just love this quote, and um, I, I've got two little stories. So this quote really stood out to me. Um, this is the president and CEO of, of the Collaborative for Academic and Social Emotional Learning. Um, and she said, when physical distancing is deemed necessary, social and emotional connectiveness is even more important. Sorry, let me check the battery low. <laughs> 
sorry, my battery was low. Um, so um, another story here is a uh, friend and city council member uh, said to me, um, right when we were hearing those kind of buzzwords of social distancing, um, so it's not in fact social distancing, but rather the physical distancing that we need to focus on here. Okay, so what is the collaborative for academic um, and social emotional learning? Um, this is a worldwide leader in advancing social emotional science, evidence-based practice and policy, and their mission is clear, right? They want to create evidence-based um, social emotional learning as, an, as a part of all um, preschools and high schools nationwide. Um, and they also provide a framework where they identify four, uh, five core competencies. And we're going to discuss these competencies. Okay, so the CASEL framework, or also known as the CASEL Five, discusses self awareness and self management, social awareness, relationship skills, and responsible decision making. Um, and we're gonna get into each of these a little bit more and, and how they're important. Okay, so self-awareness. Um, these are gonna be things like, how do I know and understand myself? How do I understand my thoughts, my cultural identity? Um, it's gonna be that we're able to identify emotions. So something that I like to say with my young people that I work with is um, name it and claim it, right? So when we're identifying emotion, to kind of put a name with the face or the feeling that we're having. Um, so that is always kind of important. And a lot of times I use um, different kinds of feeling charts. I have one here, it says like feeling words and I've got really colorful ones too. Um, also age appropriate ones that um, students kind of look and it helps kind of also to expand their vocabulary with that um, in order to accurately identify emotions. It's also going to be um, accurate self perception. Again, that is also very age specific of how we perceive ourselves. It's very important to recognize our strengths as well as our limitations. Um, um, and then things like self-confidence and self-efficacy. So am I able to, you know, do I believe in myself that I'm able to complete this task properly? Um, and then ultimately promoting a growth mindset over a fixed mindset. Um, self-management, uh, this is going to be something like impulse control, right? How do we regulate those emotions? So I also always tell young people that it's okay that um, these emotions come up, but what we choose to do next is the real important thing. Uh, another aspect um, Another aspect is going to be stress management. So when I think of stress management, I ultimately think of self-care. So what does our social support look like? That's going to be um, a big one right now. Um, are we having fun? Are we getting some exercise each day? I know it's recommended for children to have 60 minutes of physical activity each day. Also things like nutrition. <laughs> Well, good afternoon, folks. Uh, we lost our panelist for a moment. She'll be right back. My apologies. So we're going to have a little commercial interruption. And uh, again, my name is Dr. Carlos Perez, and uh, it is a pleasure to have you here today. She'll be right back. We have uh, backup, but probably her computer uh, just failed briefly. Uh, so uh, as I mentioned, we are in beautiful Davie, Fort Lauderdale, Florida. It's a gorgeous day today, and it's probably in the low 90s, and the sun's out. And uh, really, these the last few weeks have been gorgeous uh, here in Fort Lauderdale. Um, in case you didn't know, we offer uh, in psychology, the College of Psychology within Nova Th Southeastern University, we offer bachelor's, master's, and doctoral programs. And um, we've been offering these webinars. Uh, this is actually the first time that our uh, panelist camera is down. So my apologies, she'll be right back. 
Uh, I'm going to mention to you that we have a number of programs coming up. We have some uh, coming up on um, mindfulness, and uh, I'm hosting a really exciting one on Monday, uh, May 4th at noon, uh, with uh, a number of uh, our panelists, which I'm actually picking some of my best friends at the university, um, some wonderful people, and this is a good session to bring, um, especially young people or individuals that are in mid-career uh, challenge. So, um, and we, we have a special guest who's a former dolphin, Julius Thomas, and he's going to be um, joining us. He's actually a clinical psychology doctoral student. So I'm gonna play a little bit of music for you for a second, and I'm going to uh, see what's, what I can do. So again, uh, my apologies for the interruption. Uh, we, we are having a little technical difficulty with our panelists and uh, I've somebody that's coming on in a few moments, Dr. Jungerson. Dr. Jungerson, I could hear you. Hi, sorry about that, Dr. Perez. <laughs> How are you? I'm good. This is uh, the first time we've had this, and so it's lovely for you to have joined us. <laughs> absolutely, absolutely. Uh, I'm happy. I've been uh, really interested in, in hearing uh, Dr. Owens as, as she's talking about the different models and talking about the um, uh, uh, working with the with the children, with the with school being out, and all of the. Uh, modifications that uh, I know parents and families are having to make, which reminds me a little bit of one of our earlier shark chats uh, when we talked about some of the adjustments and as well with our mental health check that we did last week. So I appreciate you uh, sharing a little bit about our, our programs with, uh, um, within the, the College of Psychology. I know it's a little bit of a segue, but I think it's important um, that, that as, as I think um, Dr. Owens mentioned, that obviously there's a lot of mental health needs going on right now within the community. There's a lot of um, uh, needs, not only with um, uh, our parenting and homeschooling, but as well as just in general, with the mental health needs of the, of the community. I was reading in the Sun Sentinel yesterday, um, as well as through my work in, in one of our other local uh, commissions about the wave of mental health needs that we have, uh, that the surge that is coming here, not only in our community, but of course in communities around the nation and around um, the world. And uh, I take it very seriously. I know our, our, uh, our counseling trainees, our faculty, all of our trainees here in the uh, College of Psychology uh, take our charge to be a part of um, 
the the services and a part of the solution i know we take this very seriously so um, part of my work uh, with the um, Broward Domestic Violence Council uh, is looking at uh, what we are going to be doing for children and families of how to meet these needs here as the months go on um, with um, services reopening and, and the community kind of getting as we slowly kind of reopen. I think we're all waiting today for the, the um, uh, next steps for our state for the reopening plan. Uh, and what our mental health community and what our schools are going to look like after, after this pandemic. So um, I, I look forward to uh, tackling this problem, which is a problem we didn't have, but I know I look forward uh, to being part of the solution and um, getting folks ready um, to uh, work with not only families, but also um, communities and services and, and um, organizations that are going through this massive change and massive reconstruction uh, with that. So, um, hi, <laughs> it looks like Dr. Owens is back. I'm going to turn it back over to Carlos, Dr. Perez, thank you. Thank you, Dr. Jungerson. Hello, Anna, <laughs> Dr. Owens, so nice to see you again. And let me unmute you. Okay, hello. Well, this is exciting to have you back. <laughs> I'm back, I really apologize for that. I don't know exactly what happened. I got kicked off, but I guess that is the age that we live in, right? Right, and we definitely, this is an unscripted, this is live, and <laughs> really it's, it's about um, bringing all these people over to Nova Southeastern University. So let me uh, turn myself off and and uh, are you ready to continue? I, I think I'm ready again. Give me one second. Yeah, share your screen. Our apologies okay. to everyone there and we didn't intend a commercial interruption. And thank you for Dr. Jungerson, who's the chairperson of the counseling program. Dr. Owens here, she's uh, adjusting. I'm gonna mention uh, for there's some people signing up. We've got Close to 700 people on today. Oh, hello, everyone. <laughs> and, and I, I had to move my location, so I do apologize, but I'm ready to go, and I'm going to pick up right at self-management. Right now, I could definitely use some um, some of the impulse of regulating my own emotions, because I can tell you my heartbeat is racing, <laughs> and uh, <laughs> definitely was scrambling there for a second. So I will, um, I'm sharing my screen. I apologize for that slideshow. And uh, this is just part of um, part of the show, right? I actually planned that, right? I wanted everyone to see how um, how to handle under pressure. No, I'm just kidding. Um, so, anyways, I apologize, and I'm just going to get myself situated here. Okay, so we're talking about self management, I believe, um, and so ironically enough, our stress management and how we, like I said, regulate those emotions when things like this kind of come up. Um, so I talked about self-care and making sure that we have our social support. I also talked about making sure we had fun um, and incorporated energy or exercise and <clears throat> also things like nutrition. So am I making the choice to um, grab the bag of chips or grab um, an apple? Um, and then these are going to affect things like our rest and our sleep cycle. So those are going to be real important as well. And ultimately, each of these areas of self-care are going to affect our mood and our energy levels. <clears throat> Self-management also um, encompasses self-motivation and are, are we able to set goals for ourselves? And then also how we're able to organize, right? So those organizational skills. <clears throat> okay, social awareness. This one's going to be so important right now, too. Um, so this is the ability to take the perspective of another, which is just real important right now. There's a lot of different opinions and perspectives out there with the things that are going on. And are we able to um, show empathy and respect for others? Um, in addition, are we able to appreciate diversity and kind of include those who might be from a different um, background or culture than we are? And like I said, showing the respect for others as well. That's going to be our social awareness. 
Okay, relationship skills. This is a biggie also. So communication, how we are communicating with others. So I like to say that we are creatures of habit, especially with our communication styles with others. Um, and so if we have a negative communicating pattern, we, we tend to kind of pick that up. And, um, and so we, we can slowly make those changes, but how we're communicating with others is going to build um, these relationships. Social engagement. So this one's tough right now. We have to think outside of the box. I know myself personally, I am um, a pretty social being. And so I've had to think of ways that I can still interact with others, whether it's family, friends, um, within my community. And so even showing up to a webinar or presentation like this, this is um, social engagement. Um, so bravo, good job. Uh, also, relationship building and maintaining these relationships, that's going to be really important as well. And then are we able to work as a team and collaborate with others? Okay, responsible decision making. So this has got, you know, a couple steps. So first we're identifying problems, right? Um, identifying the problem and then analyzing the situation so that we're able to solve the problem for ourselves. Um, this includes things like evaluating and also some self-reflection, right? Reflecting on um, what are the possible choices um, and ultimately, you know, guiding you to make some, um, some good choices here. Okay, so now we're gonna talk about how we support students um, in this big transition time. Um, okay, so we know that there's a, a hierarchy of needs, right? And so Maslow, a psychologist, he developed these, um, the hierarchy of needs pyramid, kind of describing human motivation as being driven by unmet needs. So the lower level of needs need to be met before we're able to move on to the next. And so right now we're all kind of in that safety zone. We want to, we're feeling safe in our homes. Um, we're, you know, feeling secure, but we're, we're testing out the waters there. So everyone um, is, is in different stages. <clears throat> so um, it is challenging to kind of reach that peak performance when um, there's experiences in our lives um, that are kind of prohibiting us from that. And this I just thought was um, just something for us to remember, whether you're um, you know, a parent or, or a teacher, is that remember that not all kids have the same opportunity and access to um, you know, internet or really just those basic needs. So how can we ask a student to focus on academic learning when their basic needs are, are not met or they're really facing um, some challenging emotions? Okay, so when supporting students' emotions, a lot of times the way that they regulate their behaviors, it might come out looking like some of these. So they could be really worried or anxious. Um, they might in avoid interactions with others or you can start seeing the withdrawn, right? They might be staying in their room a little bit longer or sleeping a little bit longer. Um, you talk about physical or verbal aggression, um, maybe becoming really argumentative within your house. Um, also the poor in, impulse control, difficulty concentrating. Um, you might see that shut down, right? They're just not motivated to do anything. Um, negative remarks about others or about a group, um, you know, maybe expressions of anger. Um, and then also things like fidgeting, you could possibly see self harm or nail biting, kind of a little bit more of that um, anxious behavior. So these are some of the behaviors that start to come out um, with these students. Okay, so some strategies that we can work with students um, who are showing some social emotional difficulties. First, we're going to want to teach awareness, right? How they can recognize, engage their own emotional state. And we're going to talk about some ways to do that in a couple slides. Um, and then even to be aware of their own body language as well. 
Also, you want to maintain um, a calm voice and demeanor when you're engaging with the student. So again, whether you're a teacher, parent, or caregiver, you want to kind of maintain that calm, um, cool, collect type thing. Uh, another thing, providing vocabulary. So I know earlier I showed you that vocabulary list, um, or they have different charts like feeling wheels and, and things like that. So providing a child or adolescent with the appropriate vocabulary to attach to their feelings. We we'll want to demonstrate some calming techniques. We're also going to get into those. Um, response examples in social situations. So this could be something like role playing um, so that they can appropriately know how they might respond in certain situations. Another big thing is going to be to identify triggers. Um, so making sure that we provide a safe place to express these emotions. That's going to be key too. Students need to feel safe in order to, um, in order to kind of move forward. And also you can use breaks and cool downs. Um, so a lot of times, like if you're a parent right now and you're in your home and your child is, um, you know, being argumentative, you know, use a break or say, you know, I'm not comfortable engaging in this conversation right now or, you know, this tone. So let's take a break and we'll come back and we'll talk in a half an hour. So things like that are definitely appropriate. And if you remain calm, um, that child is also going to kind of emulate your, your behaviors as well. Okay, so we can't not talk about COVID-19. I didn't want this whole presentation to be centered around um, the pandemic, but I think it is important to recognize that um, when we talk about our kids and our teens, students, um, that they, they might be having some sadness and it can come out in a, in a range of different emotions, right? Um, so it could come out as anger, like this stupid thing doesn't work anymore, um, resisting, the way things need to, to be working now. Um, you know, I'm not doing these problems. My teacher's not gonna check it. Uh, also the tiredness, so feeling lethargic or maybe a little bit lazy, lazing around the house. You don't wanna go for a walk, you're feeling too tired, um, numbing out. So just, you know, 30 more minutes on the Xbox, those kind of things. <laughs> Displayed frustration. So, you know, I didn't want lasagna, I wanted tacos for dinner. So you might get some of that. And then also boredom. But the boredom and many all these emotions kind of tie back that um, students in general are feeling sad. They didn't get to say goodbye to their friends. They didn't have, um, you know, promotion ceremonies, graduations, awards, um, all of those kind of fun activities that happen at the end of the school year. Um, so that's that's kind of one, some of the feelings that they might, um, some of the sadness that they might be experiencing, and then how it might come out in other emotions. Okay, next I want to talk about some resources for students. So how um, can we support students right now? And, and that's a challenge, right? I know it's a challenge. I um, have a lot of teacher friends and parents and just different individuals that have reached out into the community and everyone's, um, you know, sort of at their capacity, right? They're doing the best they can. Um, they're checking in with family members and friends. But as far as working full time and maybe trying to teach their children, um, it's stressful. And so it's stressful on parents. It's definitely stressful on, on teachers. Um, so one thing that I love to do um, with young people, so this could be whether I'm working with an individual or in a um, small or large group setting, is to kind of have a check-in, and I love using scaling questions. Um, so this one's great. So it says, today I am surviving, managing, or thriving, and that's okay. So, you know, you might ask the question on a scale of one to ten, one being I'm just surviving, I'm, you know, barely getting done what I need to, I can't get out of bed, it's not a good day. Um, you know, a five would be, you know, I'm managing and uh, things are going okay, I got some things done, but I still have other things to do. And then a 10 or a thriving would be, everything's going great, I reorganized my pantry, all the kids' homework is done, laundry's done, you know, you're really feeling great about the day. Um, and so if I was with a, um, a group setting, I may ask them, okay, you know, show on your hands, you know, I would explain what the scaling question is and what it means. I might say, on a 
you know, show, show your hands if, um, you know, if you're like a level four or you're a level five, or maybe you're an eight, uh, you know, an eight or a six. So uh, that way we can kind of check in with the room as well. So, you know, dealing with difficult feelings. Um, again, I noticed we, uh, we kind of talked a little bit about, you know, naming the feeling earlier. Um, so I would just encourage students to kind of notice the feeling, right? Identifying it um, and then naming it. So I am feeling, maybe even using a new feeling vocabulary word that they've, lear that they've learned. Um, sit with that feeling for, for a moment. And although that can feel pretty uncomfortable, that's okay. Um, I think there's a little, if we're able to sit with that uncomfortable feeling for a little while, then we're ready to release it. And it, it sets in a little bit better for us. Um, okay, so now we're gonna talk about some mindfulness practices and skills. So I'm gonna give three examples. We'll kind of walk through them a little bit. And there's a ton of, um, great resources out online too. So I kind of wanted to walk you through them and then um, these are things that you could be trying on your own as well. So we're going to talk about mindful breathing. Um, we're also going to talk about what a body scan is um, and, and how we can teach someone to do that. And then also the heartbeat exercise. So kind of paying attention to your heartbeat and the role that that plays in um, our emotions. Okay, so mindful breathing. Um, this is something, again, I am not a breathing expert, but this is something that you can do really quickly, either for yourself. Um, I know when I just had a technical issue, I said, okay, I have to just calm for a second. So I tried to slow my breath and just focus. And so what's gonna be important here is you wanna find a relaxing place. You can sit or you could even lay on the floor, whatever's comfortable for you. Um, and you want to breathe in and out really deeply. And so if I was walking a student through this, I probably would give them about a minute and I would guide them through walking. I also might encourage them to um, imagine the air moving or maybe to visualize, um, you know, a picture, an example was visualizing a sailboat with the kind of waves in inhaling and exhaling on top of the water. So lots of different examples, but a lot of times when we're able to breathe and visualize, um, that helps. So taking one last deep breath and release it. And then you want to notice how your body feels and do you feel a little bit more calm or relaxed? So that is kind of a breathing exercise that we can use. Next is the body scan. And I really love the body scan um, when, I was work when I'm working with students who may be feeling anxious um, or angry. I felt like those were usually two um, good times to use the body scan. So you wanna to listen to your body. And this is a real simple exercise, similar to the breathing. Um, you either can lie down or you can sit in a chair, whatever's um, comfortable for you. And first what you're gonna do is you're gonna squeeze your kind of your toes together, your feet, curl your feet, whatever kind of tension you can create down to your, your thighs, squeeze your stomach, just squeeze every part of your body, make every part of your body really tense. And you can go through each area of the body. And you're gonna notice the feeling of tension and discomfort, so squeezing, and then you kind of let it go and release, right? And through this, um, after a few seconds, you kind of notice that the muscles have relaxed, and then you think about how your body was reacting throughout this exercise. So starting with the real the tension that you're feeling, if maybe you're anxious or angry, everything is so tight, and then the actual release and um, relaxing that go of your body. Also including um, you know, breathing throughout this. So that is kind of what a body scan, and then we're scanning our entire body to see where do we notice maybe a little bit more tension um, and what does that mean to us? Why do we feel that tension there? 
Okay, the heartbeat exercise. So I think I just participated in this about 10 minutes ago when my heartbeat was, you know, going a mile a minute. Um, but this is kind of a, a real easy tool, it teaches children to notice the heartbeat. Um, to start out, they're gonna jump up and down or they can do, you know, jumping jacks. Um, and then when you finish, you're gonna put your hand either here on your pulse or hand on your heart um, and kind of close your eyes, only noticing your heartbeat and noticing your breath. And then when you open your eyes, um, you want to say, you know, what, what feelings did you notice? How was your breathing? And again, those are just kind of check-in, really quick exercises that we can do with children and adolescents. Okay, I really love this. Um, uh, this is something that you can really uh, change and however it suits you best. So happiness throughout the week. So mindful Monday, that could be completely different. Something that I come up with or something that you come up with, but to set the intention for the day that on Monday, I'm going to do something mindful. Tuesday, gratitude Tuesday. So I'm going to show or write out some things that I'm grateful for. Wellness Wednesday, Thoughtful Thursday, Freedom Friday, Social Saturday, and Soul Sunday. So again, these are all um, just ideas of things that you can, you know, like I said, tons of charts and things, but these are things that we can really focus on and do at home um, and hopefully helps us kind of stick to a little bit of a routine. Um, so I think I mentioned earlier that I'm going to uh, be sending out a resource list because these are all online resources. And so I want you to be able to access them. And um, again, they're just things that I found um, to be really helpful. So the Brain Pop, this provides movies with social emotional learning components. Um, students can uh, watch and respond to. We talked about Castle already, just a ton of resources there. Um, Centervention, so this is a game-based behavior. Um, interventions to kind of help students um, and then a couple more so I'm going to make sure that each participant has these resources as well so they'll have the embedded links too that you can check out on your own time okay supporting parents caregivers and families so we need to focus on the parent caregiver well-being too uh, and then also provide them with the tools. So um, as much as we wanna focus on our um, students, we do need to be focusing on parents as well because this is a stressful moment in time um, for parents, caregivers, and families. Um, so tricks are for kids, but social emotional learning is not just for kids. And I think that's really important to, to realize is that um, these skills, they, they are something that we continue to um, develop and foster and some we're not so great at and others we're still working on and that's okay, right? We can all start where we are. We can meet you where you're at and then grow and develop these skills too. So I think that's important for parents to know is that, um, that we can be flexible and we can still make some of these changes as well. Okay, I really just love this. A lot of these, you know, images and things I, I've found on online or maybe even social media or different um, pages that I follow. And I really just love this one because I've reached out to a lot of um, parents, colleagues, um, teachers, and, you know, there's, there's a real um, worry about students falling behind. So I'm just going to read this to you. It says, Dear parents, don't stress about schoolwork. In September, I will get your children back on track. I am a teacher and that is my superpower. What I can't fix is social emotional trauma that prevents the brain from learning. So right now, I need you to share your calm, share your strength, and share your laughter with your children. No kids are ahead, no kids are behind. Your children are exactly where they need to be. With love, all teachers on planet Earth. Um, so I just thought that was interesting because I've, I've definitely had some parents be really concerned, um, you know, whether it's AP testing or that their child has reading deficiencies. So I know that there's a lot of worry um, and just know that educators across the board are working 
around the clock to make sure that our students are supported come next year. Okay, so some tips for, you know, for families, right, for parents. So you're going to want to pay close attention to your own feelings of stress and anxiety. Uh, make sure that you're practicing self-care strategies, so eating healthy, getting enough sleep, exercising, uh, taking breaks if you need them. <clears throat> if you find yourself being overwhelmed, find way, you know, overwhelmed with, with negative thoughts. Make sure you're finding ways that you can um, reframe your thinking. Um, and also, if you need, make sure that you're um, seeking out the support of a mental health professional for either yourself or a loved one. You're also going to want to acknowledge and support um, your children and their emotions, right? So again, we want to kind of offer this calm and, and reassurance for them. Um, lots of ways to help your children express them and their feelings. This could be through conversation, music, art, dance, writing, um, journaling, so many different ways. So tuning into how they're feeling throughout the day um, is, is going to be important. Another one is providing age appropriate information. Um, we want to limit the, you know, television, um, limit the social media, help children understand, you know, if there's misinformation um, or maybe a stereotype related to um, the disease going on. You want to share with your children um, what you're doing to keep them safe, right? This is going to help children learn um, these strategies. So things like hand washing to stay healthy um, and these these practices are going to help them feel like they have a little bit of uh, a little bit more sense of control. Um, so whenever possible, and we kind of put that in quotations, providing uh, consistency in our daily routine. So things like meal time, bedtimes, um, you know, that can help also foster that sense of safety. A big one is practicing patient. Um, so especially when our routines are disrupted, this usually leads to behavior issues or meltdowns. Um, so uh, try to comfort your child, but also um, setting some boundaries um, and, and trying to create new schedules and routines that are going to promote kind of um, families um, coming together. You got to get creative about how to maintain um, their friendships and social um, connections. So um, I know I have an eight-year-old niece and she, my, my brother downloaded um, Kids Messenger so they can call and connect and that's like a safer platform for kids to connect and um, they're able to kind of message and phone message their friends. Um, and then make sure that you're reaching out to the school and community organizations. Um, if you don't necessarily, I think keeping in touch with at that community level is going to also make your child still feel connected and you as well. Okay, so some of the resources um, for parents, care, caregivers and families. So 10 things that that we can do at home. So first, you want to focus on your child's strengths, right? So they might be taking uh, an online test, and maybe they didn't do so hot, right? And you think, how, how did you not, how did you get a 70 on this take-home test or this virtual test? Um, so instead of jumping to that, we want to, um, you know, kind of pr praise the specific strengths and um, you know, talk about what they did well first. So I always say start with the positive and then where are the areas of improvement? So those are gonna be um, important, important ways to focus on the strengths. Another big one is following up consequences for the misbehavior. So sometimes parents will say, you know, because of what you did, no TV for a month. And then they don't follow up with that so, because it's not realistic. Um, so decide on a consequence that's fair um, and that you're able to carry out. Another way, uh, another, something else you can do at home is um, ask children how they feel. Um, by asking them the, these questions, it makes them feel like uh, the message is that you care and um, that their feelings matter. Um, 
find ways to stay calm when you're feeling upset or angry. Um, so it's definitely normal to feel irritated um, or to, you know, we're going to want to learn how to recognize our own trigger situations. Um, so take a few deep breaths. Maybe consider having kind of a quiet area where people can go if they're upset. Um, you also want to avoid humiliating or even mocking your child. So sometimes we might see this as, you know, sarcasm, but um, ultimately that just leads to a lack of self-confidence and then usually problems um, with schoolwork or maybe getting um, into trouble with friends. So. I also think it's really important to be willing to apologize um, if, if they said something that they didn't mean and then to also clearly explain, um, you know, where they were coming from and that they got upset and that they apologized for the reaction. So again, modeling that behavior for, for children and in, in adolescents. Um, also giving children choices and respecting their, um, their wishes. So when children have a chance, they're learning to make their own choice. They're learning how to solve problems. Um, so again, asking questions like open-ended questions that help them um, solve their own problems. So if you're used to solving the problems for your for your child, this really uh, um, harms their ability to solve these issues themselves. Um, you can read books or stories together, uh, a great way to kind of learn about other people um, or maybe even your own family heritage. And then encourage sharing and helping. So this could be um, right now, maybe some volunteer. Um, you could do a fundraising walkathon or help out an elderly um, neighbor, maybe drop off some um, canned goods or some food to a um, uh, a local shelter. So those kind of things, those are what we can be working on at home. Some other activities, so playing a board game, going on a walk, we talked about using a journal, um, you know, mindfulness, breathing and skills, reading, coloring, um, uh, writing a compliments list. So I've seen some families have a jar and everyone writes three or four, you know, positive compliments. And then, you know, each day you kind of pull one out and, and read them. Um, I love things like this. This is like one of those conversation starters. And so um, I've encouraged parents to um, eat dinner together um, at, at the dining table if they can, or all together at the same time and to have something like this. And then each person pulls out. So I pulled out um, two cards and it says, um, one of them says, if you could speak a foreign language fluently, which one would it be? So for me, it would be French. And then if, what are you looking forward to most on your next vacation? And, you know, then we could all go around and share. Um, so things like that, just to kind of build that rapport within your own family. Okay, again, these are going to be um, resources that I'll provide to you, but um, just real quickly, some, you know, ways that you can cook with kids, how to make household, household chores fun, um, creating kindness rocks. So I know I had my rock earlier, but you can paint rocks. Um, so that's, you know, kind of a arts and crafts activity. And then you can um, put joy by putting them all around your neighborhood so others can find the rocks. Um, you want to help your family to de-stress. Um, another resource is um, going to be talking about screen time, um, how much screen time. Um, great Alexa skills for teens and, and uh, for kids and teens. So if you have an Alexa in your house or in your kitchen, you can use that. Um, Self-care strategies for parents and then um, air and space anywhere. So I know, for instance, Tons of museums are giving free access to their museums and you can do virtual tours. Um, so that could be something fun and interesting that you could do with your children as well. Okay, so focus um, is always on, you know, kind of the community connections and relationships. So how do we keep this focus, right? Um, especially in times like this. So I'm going to give you a couple examples. Um, so calling all superheroes. So this, for instance, is a superhero 5K virtual run. So this is a nonprofit 
organization, Professionals United for Parkland, and it could be fun for the whole family. So it was meant to be a, you know, you know, a live 5K race this coming Saturday. So it's actually happening right now. And you can log in, um, you dress up as your favorite superhero. So you could do this as an individual or with your family, with the kids. You walk or run the 5K and you're able to um, track your distance. So they have um, apps like um, Map My Run and I think like Apple Watch, different things like that can show the distance. They can kind of log the distance that you did. Um, so if you register for this race, um, you, after you submit, you can submit your picture, you can submit um, your, your time. And then after the race, you get a free swag bag. They'll get a medal for participating in the race and a t-shirt. So just kind of a fun way that you could engage still with your community, supporting a cause that you care about um, and, and having fun, right? It, it might be fun for the kids and the parents to dress up in a superhero um, costume or put like a little mask on, um, you know, not a mask like this, but maybe a mask on their eyes, something a little bit different. So that's just one example of kind of connecting with our community. Okay, so uh, another thing that you could do is contacting the school counselor, right? Um, school counselors are uniquely qualified to address academic, career, and social emotional development in all students. Um, they are leaders and advocates that work in collaboration to promote access to education. Um, so the school counselor's role has certainly shifted a little bit in these online settings, um, but they definitely are there to um, schedule individual student meetings or group, um, sending out positive material. Um, they're working in collaboration with teacher, staffs, and administration to help support students and families. And this is going to be a big one. If you or um, you know your child or adolescent is struggling right now, connecting with your school counselor, they're going to be able to provide you with um, crisis resources within your area. Um, so they may not be able to have a one-on-one -on -one session on a daily basis, but if there is um, an emergency or any mental health concerns, that they can definitely provide you with resources. Um, a lot of school counselors that I know have been adding um, guidance lessons or school counseling lessons on, you know, academic career and social emotional topics for um, students to use. And then they are also offering these kind of online office hours. So definitely reaching out to your um, school counselor. Okay, so why are social connections so important? Um, you know, we got to find ways, uh, creative ways to maintain these friendships and social connections. And why are they important? They improve self-confidence, self-worth. Um, these relationships and connections help you reach and, and kind of set new goals. Um, it's also going to boost your, your happiness and reduce stress. Um, you're going to be focused on others and not so much just ourselves. You're going to increase um, your sense of belonging and purpose. Um, you also will be in, um, encourage you to maybe avoid some unhealthy lifestyle habits. And also these social connections are going to help you deal with um, specific traumas that you may be dealing with. So it could be the divorce, um, the loss of a loved one, uh, maybe you or um, someone you know lost a job recently. So. That's why those social connections are so important. Okay, and the last thing that we're gonna discuss is how do we take action, right? So this is kind of a, a family activity that you can do. Um, and I, you're pretty much going to be creating a family action plan. So think about how to promote social, emotional connectedness and engagement. So the first thing you wanna do is set your intention. What are your goals for social emotional learning improvements within your house, right? And they don't have to be these huge goals, but make, set an intention, set a goal, however big or small. Um, also know how do you access these social emotional learning resources and then how do you address your needs? So we have provided a lot of um, resources in this um, webinar. 
Um, and then ask yourself, how will you cultivate a commitment, right? Your level of commitment to support this social emotional engagement in your home. Um, and then as a family, you can brainstorm ideas together on how you're going to establish this within your family system so that you guys are continuously um, improving. And then what that will look like for your family is going to be different for other families. So that's just a quick way that you can try to take some action within your own family setting. Um, and then, you know, this last slide, my heart really goes out to all of our graduating seniors, whether you are in high school or finishing a um, bachelor's or master's degree or doctoral degree. Um, so I really wanted to just honor those students and um, dedicate this to all of our graduating class of 2020. Um, so I said the, the foreign language that I would love to learn uh, fluently was French, so merci et au revoir, and um, that's all I have for you. So I am welcome to any questions or feedbacks, and I really thank you all for being here. Again, I apologize for my technical difficulties. I'd like to say that I planned that to show how we um, manage under stress, but unfortunately I didn't. Um, so thank you all so much. I really appreciate it. So you had a, a couple of questions there, and uh, there's a few questions that are popping up. But uh, one of the things I'm, I'm curious about the school counseling field, um, because uh, there's so many people, so many students that I've worked with for years that are interested in becoming school counselors. What do you see as the future for this career? Yeah, well, I currently um, teach our future school counselors as well, and um, I definitely think, I, I'm here in South Florida, but I think across the nation, there's such a um, urgency for mental health concerns, especially for school-aged children, um, more precedent than, than we've ever seen. So I, I definitely see a need for school counselors in the future. Um, you know, there's just there's going to be a, a large push for that. And then especially after um, this pandemic, right, how are we making sure that we're meeting the needs of our future generations? And school counselors, um, as I mentioned, they are the ones who are positioned um, within the school and also have that mental health um, background. Somebody named Bianca would like us to know that uh, school psychologists are also qualified and we have uh, many friends here that are in the school psychology program. Yes, there, there are there are teammates. We work together. So I'm just scrolling to see if I could select some questions for you. Mostly we've had just wonderful comments and um, yeah. I really love the commercial interruption that you gave me. <laughs> yeah. And you know, one of the things when I, when I created these discussions, I want them to be casual, real conversations where they're not scripted. I mean, so obviously you're prepared because that's what you've done as an um, as a professor. You're prepared, but it's it really it it's obvious that it's something that you're passionate about. Uh, There's some people that were asking information about some of the slides on emotional learning and in, information. So uh, I will do a follow up email for everybody that attended. Yeah. And um, if you have additional direct questions, you could email psychology at nova.edu that's easy enough to remember psychology at nova.edu um is somebody is asking if this presentation will be available later yes it will it will be the recording is usually posted in two or three business days this offer this program does not offer a certificate it is not a, a credit program unfortunately it's one hour of discussion and hopefully you're you're gaining some information that from this we want you to. We want to encourage you to share these discussions with uh, your colleagues, your friends, your family, and uh, let them know that they can reach all of it at uh, nova.edu forward slash Shark Chats. Is I, I haven't got any other specific questions. Is there any uh, final <laughs> word, uh, final thoughts you want to leave with? 
No, I just, uh, I appreciate everyone's um, patience. Obviously, I didn't expect for, um, you know, I, I logged on an hour early and I guess I didn't realize that uh, maybe something happened. So <laughs> I really appreciate everyone um, staying on and uh, yeah, it was, I'm glad I got to share some of this information with you. So uh, somebody was asking about the next presentation. We have one tomorrow, uh, very focused on young people as well with Dr. Pete Caproni and a team of psychologists. We encourage you to sign in for that. Uh, again, the address to locate that is at nova.edu forward slash shark chats. I wanna give a shout out to Marielena in Patterson where I grew up, PS 18. Uh, she's got a student load of 685 students. The State County Tech, I think we had 2,000 students for about two counselors. Sorry, I had to speak to my friends in New Jersey on this. That's okay. Um, I yeah. imagine that it's a challenge as a school counselor because you want to do prevention programs, you want to do education programs, you want to do preparation for college and vocational training. What yeah, is, and uh, this presentation wasn't so much about um, school counselor advocacy, but really advocating for our profession and what specifically school counselors can do within the school. Um, I know for, um, you know, when I was a school counselor, I had a caseload of 900 and then 600. And so exactly, it, it, it feels overwhelming. And so um, the American School Counseling Association recommends um, 250 to every one school counselor. And we know that's just not the case. Um, so that's why I just really encourage, um, you know, any school counselors that I know, and especially future school counselors, that it's so important to advocate for our profession and really work with your administrative team so that they know the value that you bring um, and just how many wonderful things that you can do outside of, you know, lunch duty and testing and, and those kind of um, catch all things that a lot of times school counselors get, um, you know, get stuff doing. So, so tomorrow at noon, we're, we're hosting a, a team of school psychologists. On, on uh, Friday at noon, we're hosting a very special humanitarian presentation with uh, a number of people that have attended, uh, participated in humanitarian efforts uh, that are psychologists. And then on Monday, I'm going to be part of a panel, hosting a panel that includes a former dolphin who's a, uh, currently in our clinical psychology program, Julius Thomas, and a number of uh, great professionals, some of my best friends here at the university. And we're going to talk about um, ideas and positive psychology and, and what we can do to inspire young people. So... Um, we really encourage you to share that event with your uh, students, with your, your school counselors, with your school psychologists. Uh, if we could get a couple of thousand young people online, uh, we're going to talk about sports, we're going to talk about fitness, and we're going to talk about learning, training, higher education, vocational training, anything we can do to inspire our young people. I, and one of the things I can imagine with the field, I know a lot of schools are moving to uh, embracing technology, and I, I can only imagine that school counselors, this is a, a modality that you can use to inspire young people. And I hope schools will uh, engage with universities and um, work together with also graduate students. We, we deploy a lot of graduate students into the schools and work with them in their practicum. So it's all about sharing in education. I think it's, a, it's really something that we don't realize that the American uh, university college system is, is one of the greatest in the world and it offers so much opportunity. So Dr. Owens, thank you so much for your time. I think we answered our questions and uh, you will get a, a follow-up email that uh, comes in automatically and there will be an evaluation. So we encourage you to, to submit and respond and let us know how we did. Uh, it's really a pleasure serving you. NSU is here for you. And come visit us in Fort Lauderdale someday. Send us your, uh, your students. Thank you, Dr. Owens. Thank you. Have a great day.